Hey friends, welcome back to the Gubba Homestead. I'm Gubba and today we are gonna be going through the difficulties of homesteading, what most people won't tell you about. In my last video, I discussed why people like Ballerina Farms could be ruining homesteading, so you can go check that out and what I think is going on in the homesteading community. And I thought based on the comments that I received, it would be a good idea to go through the difficulties of homesteading, the side that you you may not see or have heard you know online we just see the good stuff we see the good days hardly ever the bad days so when we're seeing those good days we think that it is just yip skippity super easy so let's dive in right now I am sitting in my garden so I thought this was appropriate to talk about gardening and homesteading and it seems pretty cool online you see these immaculate gardens or these backyard gardens well gardening can take unexpected turns and and I understand that they can dampen your spirit if you're super pumped up to start gardening. But in my experience, let me talk about what is going on this year. First of all, there are different gardening zones depending on where you live. Maybe you live in a dry area, a rainy area, different kinds of soils. So it is suggested to get a soil test wherever you move or if you wanna know what's going on in your soils, then you can amend the soil nutrients properly because that will affect how your plants grow, your produce grows. If you don't have a green house or a hoop house you will be a bit dependent on the weather a few years ago there was a huge hailstorm that rolled through late summer and took out part of my garden so there are unexpected weather events if you don't have protective covering also when you are planning a garden you want to consider watering so once it gets to summer and it's super dry after the spring rainfall you gotta plan out how your plants are gonna get water i currently do not have an irrigation system in my garden and i have a larger garden as you can see behind me i have all these raspberries i have blackberries uh we'll get to my produce situation i have fruit trees that need a lot of water through the day and because of that, because I don't have irrigation, I have to manually move a hose throughout the day or have a sprinkler going, but then with sprinklers, you have to be considerate because if you get water on the leaves during the super hot part of the day, it can scorch the leaves. So I move the hose around through the day to all my trees that need water. When you plant trees, they need water ideally for three years before, or three seasons before they can be self-sufficient and can get water themselves from the ground. Even then they may need supplementation. So when you are growing your garden, it is so cool growing your own food, but you have to take those things into consideration with your area, your watering situation, how you're gonna care for these plants, the soil, and another unexpected event that I had happen in my garden this year, aside from the weather, is I had a massive influx of voles. And what voles are, they're like these little ground mice that dig tunnels everywhere. And so when spring was coming in, and I noticed all of these holes and just more and more showing up, I was like, okay, I don't have any cats because I have so many dogs and my dogs aren't particularly friendly with cats. So that is a downfall. My dogs do hunt the voles, but they'll like dig around all day, but I have garden fencing. So they don't come into the garden because I don't want them to dig in my garden beds. And what ended up happening is when I was planting all of my, you know, seedlings that I've gotten to starts and um, planting them out here in the garden, I noticed over the course of a few days, they were chomped and gone from the voles. They just took out every single thing that I planted besides strawberries. They did munch on my strawberries, but strawberries are pretty resilient and they came back. So that was a huge bummer. I will be more dependent on local farmers for my produce this summer. Unexpected turn. And when looking into solutions, one of the solutions was I could poison the voles, but I can't do that because my dogs hunt the voles. Every few years they have a population boom. So there are things in your garden that are gonna take an unexpected turn. And one thing that I saw another homesteader, you know, really downtrodden about is that the weeds, they never stop coming. And they don't. I have a garden with a lot of weeds. I get to them when I can. Mostly I focus on my beds. That's where I focus my time instead of just the weeds around the area. So I have some decorative weeds and I'm okay with that because I have to extend my time to where I can. So keep that in mind. Gardening will be a pursuit. It's doable. You just have to put some forethought into it. 
be considerate of your area, and most importantly, water. <laughs> I don't mind coming out here to water every day, so I water and I get up in the morning, come around and water everything, and then I put hoses on my fruit trees, which reminds me you can run into diseases. I ran into some problems with my peach trees where the leaves came back. The peach trees are alive, but the leaves are struggling, which tells me that the tree is struggling. I've done some research. I'm going to amend the soil. I got some organic fertilizer that I will be laying down for my peach trees. Another thing you can do is water and molasses to help get those nutrients into the tree. So be prepared for what you plant and you just got to take it as it comes or else your garden can consume you. When it comes to homesteading, you're going to have tons of projects going on. So keep that in mind with your time so you don't get overwhelmed. I'm more of a heavy focus on my animals and yes, I do my garden as much as I can, but I'm really focused on my goats for my milk and now I'm debating on what I want to do with the babies and that brings me to my next thing animals. The next part about homesteading that people may not think, but I have, as you can see, personal experience with is the animals. There are a lot of different dynamics that play a part when it comes into owning livestock. Cows, goats, sheep, chickens. First of all, you need to consider the cost. You're going to want to weigh that out before you get the animals. So the feed, if you live in an area like I do with long winters, I need to consider hay for the winter and I wanna get the best quality hay, so that's sourcing from a farmer who doesn't spray. Also, one thing that you will quickly get acquainted with on your homestead is death. And if death makes you extremely uncomfortable, it may be jarring at first. It was for me experiencing deaths of chickens and I also had a goat that passed away and there have been, you know, other animals that I have experienced that part of life with. And at first, it, it's always hard, but at first, because we are so disconnected from the death of our livestock, it is completely difficult. We just go to Walmart, pick up a piece of chicken breast, and we have no idea what kind of life that chicken lived. We have no idea what they were fed. We have no idea how they were cared for. So we are completely disconnected from our food. I am grateful that I get to reconnect in this manner. And right now, another thing to consider, especially if you have dairy animals, what are you gonna do with the cute little babies? So. I have Nigerian dwarfs and I'm currently considering if I want to do dual purpose. They are great for milk, but they are also great for meat. And so that would be something that I could not fathom a few years ago. Oh my God, goodness, how could I take this cute little baby and feed my family? But now I am in my food. I know their day-to-day -day life and I am comfortable with that fact. I may still sell them, give them away, not sure, but that will be another era on my homestead. Another aspect to consider, so this is my milking girl, is that you are going to have animals that are more difficult than others. So for example, I have to tie up her leg because she kick, 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 kicks. You're gonna have a bunch of different personalities. So all these animals come with different personalities and some might work for your homestead and some might not work for your homestead. You also have to consider what you are needing on your homestead. So if you're needing milk, meat, fiber, that is going to play a huge part. So when I first moved out to my homestead, I got in over my head by getting a milk cow. Quickly realized my milk cow wasn't for me, didn't work the best for my land, and now I have goats. Now, if you have a milking animal, that is entirely different. So milking animals require extra attention once or twice a day, depending on what kind of schedule you have them on. I'll explain the schedule that I am doing right now. But if you don't properly milk them or take care of them, they can get mastitis, they can die from mastitis, which is an infection in their udder, and you do not want that. If your whole purpose is to have a milk animal, take care of them so then you can properly milk them. Also, because they require so much extra attention, it's gonna make it virtually impossible to leave your homestead. That is just a real fact, unless you have somebody you know who can milk, or you can have a milk machine and teach somebody how to use the milk machine. So there are options. I hardly ever leave because 
of what I'm doing right now. You also are going to have animals that don't quite fit your homestead. This girl right here is super sassy, but her milk is amazing. So you just have to keep in mind what you want for your homestead. All these animals come with different personalities. And what I do for my milking schedule is I still have the babies with the moms for 12 hours a day, and then I separate them for 12 hours a day. And at the end of the 12 hours a day, I get the moms out in the morning. They're out foraging for 12 hours, and then you are now here with me while I am milking. And what I do is I get a quart from each of the girls that I am milking, and then I let the babies milk out the rest to keep their milk supply up and babies healthy, happy, and growing. So the goats that I have done, they have been raised on their mom's milk, which is the most beneficial thing as compared to formula. I take extra caution in raising any animals here on the homestead. I want them as natural as possible. So you just have to consider their needs. Also goats, so side note, they are susceptible to parasites. So that's an extra thing that I have to keep an eye on. Whereas cows, not so much. Somebody is here working one of the farmers. So that is what is going on right now in the background. Another thing to consider when it comes to animals is do you have a vet in your area who can take care of your animal if you're in an emergency. So I am in an area where I don't have a vet who is specialized in goats. So I have to specialize myself. I had an emergency with my goat after she gave birth. She had milk fever, meaning her blood calcium levels dropped. And I figured that out from a book that I had on hand. I went out, saw what was going on, looked up her symptoms and treated accordingly. So it is beneficial to have a livestock veterinarian who can help you through difficult times, especially when you start homesteading, you're gonna have a lot of firsts and you're not gonna know what to do. It will help if you know people who are doing the same thing. You can even join online forums where people discuss milking goats or discuss chickens and discuss beef cows. So try to find your community. And that leads me into my next thing about homesteading that a lot of people won't talk about. The last thing to consider that I feel like a lot of homesteaders don't touch on or share about is this way of life can be isolating. And I'm speaking on that because I experience it, but I am a homebody. I don't like to travel. I love being here, so it works for me. But when you move somewhere and you're in a rural area and you have some land, it's a different community dynamic. I feel like my neighbors are more involved. Your neighbors can absolutely make or break it for you. If you get a crazy neighbor, you see those stories online and that can be extremely difficult. Try your best to identify that before moving if possible to maybe find out what's going on in the community, look at records, see if anybody has been arrested in your area and what uh, you have going on. And like mentioned, if you have a milk animal, you pretty much are going to be married to your homestead. Leaving will be even more extremely difficult than if you have other things going on. A garden you can automate, you can have other systems going on in your homestead that you can automate, but a milking animal is hands-on, whether that's by your own hands or a machine. I would encourage, if you do this, to find places that you can source food from locally try to reach out to your community, find little pockets of your people, your tribe. A way to do that is through As Your Standard. It's like an online organic Costco. It's pretty cool. I still get hauls from there and some things from As Your Standard. It's better than Costco because you don't have to have a membership and it has a lot of non-GMO options and this isn't sponsored i'm just speaking from experience because when i have ordered from there what it is you put in your order and then there's a community drop spot where once a month they drop off your groceries and other things that you order i mean they have toiletries they have plants they have tools they have a lot of cool stuff on there and you go there once a month and you can meet other people in your community who might be you know have similar interests to what you are doing so you will have to be more proactive, I feel, living in a more rural or homestead life to meet others and to break away from your homestead. You have to be more thoughtful if you are going to travel and 
I feel like for a lot of people, this could be extremely isolating and taxing. You see movies like Castaway where the guy goes crazy on an island. I think I would be fine because I, I'm good with my animals. <laughs> But I understand that is not the case for a lot of people. And that is okay, there is nothing wrong with that. It's just more I wanna share with you so you know what you are getting yourself into. I encourage everyone to start homesteading wherever they are at, and the best place to do that is in your kitchen by having sourdough, pickling food, fermenting food. I'm actually about to make some fermented pickles and I'm really excited about that. But starting there, getting your you know hands in the ground, maybe doing a little gardening, just little things and working your way up. Don't dive head in because you will then really burn yourself out <laughs> along with all the other projects that are gonna come. So just take it a step at a time. I hope this video has been helpful so you can see kind of what I have going on in my homestead. It's very realistic. You just have to learn how to manage it. And your homestead is gonna look different than mine. Your projects will look different than mine, but I believe that you can do it if you wanna do it. So don't do anything a couple wouldn't do. And if you're interested in Azure Standard or my homestead guides or my tallow that I use for skincare, all of that will be down below and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!